When it comes to motherboards, while the newer Zeus ROG Strix X670EI gaming Wi-Fi motherboard isn't their most bleeding edge or extreme motherboard, some concessions have to be given to its size. Being mini ITX is a very limiting factor for a motherboard, but Zeus are pretty legendary when it comes to cramming an insane level of hardware into such a small package. And this board is no exception. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. I'm never gonna be an esports gamer. I never get any kills. I wouldn't be so sure of that. Is that Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com? Yes, my son, it is me, Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com. What are you doing here? I'm here to bestow upon you a gift that will transform you into a true gamer. With a 24.5 inch full HD screen, 240 hertz refresh rate, 0.5 millisecond response time, AMD FreeSync Premium, and height adjustability, you'll be gaming in the big leagues in no time. Oh, thank you. No problem, my son. Why don't you check out the link in the description below to find out more. Now, being a small board, again, doesn't mean that there are any compromises, as it's equipped with a potent 10 plus 2 VRM with what frankly seems like complete overkill, 110 amp power stages. So this little board should have no problem pushing big boost clocks on high-end Ryzen CPUs. As with any X670E board, you get support for the latest DDR5 memory, there's a durable PCIe Gen 5 slot for next-gen graphics cards, and onboard Gen 5 M.2 for next-gen storage. You also get the latest USB 4 Type-C ports and their innovative stacked array, which houses an M.2 storage space and additional heatsinks. One strange thing that you'll immediately notice is finding no audio jacks on the motherboard's rear I.O. Instead, you get the ROG Strix Hive desktop unit with various system and audio controls, giving you unrivaled flexibility, which is how they've managed to pack so much into such a small form factor. So what about the design? Well, without a doubt, this is a really great looking motherboard. It's unmistakably an ASUS board with the ROG Owl Eye logos. The words ROG and Strix splashed everywhere and that dotted digital art design we've seen across much of their product range. It's quite a shiny board too, with the larger heat sinks on the left and lower sections looking like oiled steel. And the way that they've cut in logos really plays on the whole light and shadows of the heat sinks. Those heat sinks are pretty significant too, and the board is big and heavy, considering it is mini ITX form factor. But as you can see, with all the layers peeled away, there's some serious hardware here too. There's a 10 plus 2 power solution rated for 110 amps per stage, with a bank of alloy chokes and durable capacitors that should provide reliable and stable performance on all Ryzen 7000 processors. But as we've seen on most X670E boards, brands have actually gone a little overkill when it comes to these phases, which isn't a bad thing, but it does drive the price up somewhat. Now, being a mini ITX board, there are two DDR5 slots on the board with support for 6400 MHz plus memory, and they've also got a small bit of reinforcement in the midpoint too, with that small metal strip. Now, sticking with durability, the 8-pin CPU power connector is also wrapped in metal and nestled just out of the way in the top left corner of the board, behind the rear I.O. There are all the usual RGB headers on this board too, but that's pretty much it. And that's because it doesn't stop there, because ASUS include a small card called the ROG FPS2 card, which houses USB 2 headers, a CMOS header, a CPU over voltage header, and two SATA ports. There's also a Type-C internal connector just above it on the board for the latest connectivity at the very best speeds. In terms of M.2 slots, it gets quite interesting as it's a stacked design, which also acts like a heatsink for both the M.2 drives and the motherboard's chipset. And it's actually quite tall, as ASUS have conformed to the ITX form factor, but have simply gone up in height to cater for the features. Behind the motherboard, you can see that very robust looking CPU backplate, but also a further support plate behind the VRM, providing a more stable mount and surface area for the heatsinks. The rear I.O. has a fair bit of ventilation built into it, which is great, as it allows both the VRM heatsink and the M.2 heatsink to cool the system more efficiently, especially as a smaller board will always get warmer due to the surface area limitations. As you can see, there's broad support for fast USB ports. There are two 40 gigabit per second Type-C ports and a single HDMI port, along with Wi-Fi 6E and 2.5G LAN for ultra fast networking, thanks to the chipset. So I mentioned at the start that while this board is small, it definitely packs a punch in terms of specs and features, but how does it perform? Well, as you've probably heard me say a hundred times before on motherboard videos, testing is a weird one because the board itself doesn't generally give any extra performance beyond a percent or two either way. 
So instead, we use testing to see how a board performs in comparison to other motherboards tested on the same chipset, just to kind of make sure that it sits in the same realm of performance with no outlying performance results. Now to test this board, we put it onto our X670E based test bench, featuring a Ryzen 9 7900X processor with 32 gig of Corsair Dominator Platinum 5200 MHz RGB memory. For storage, we use a Seagate Firecuda 530 1TB NVMe drive to help get rid of any pesky bottlenecks, and our GPU is the Palette RTX 3080 GameRock OC. The NCXT Z73 RGB AIO helps keep our processor under control, and all of the components are installed inside the NZXT H7 Flow case with all side panels installed, which gives us a real-world situation for when we look at VRM temperatures. For power, we use the NZXT C1000 Gold unit, and all tests are run on Windows 11 Pro 21H2. So with all that out of the way, let's jump into those glorious benchmarks. Starting things off with 3 d Mark Time Spy, and right away the performance is rock solid, scoring 17,691 in Time Spy, and letting us see that there really are no obvious bottlenecks in the PCIe throughput. Moving over to PC Mark 10 Express, and again, it's right on the money here, with no apparent issues in the overall system stability, even compared to the much more extreme ATX motherboards that we've tested. Moving over to more CPU intensive tasks, and even the Super Pi time is impressive, scoring 5 minutes and 18 seconds, which puts it on par with the larger Prime X670E Pro from ASUS. In Cinebench, I thought the 10 plus 2 VRM setup and being a smaller motherboard would hinder the CPU performance, but it did extremely well, giving us the highest score we've had, so clearly it can win in a sprint. However, for sustained loads of rendering, I'm sure the bigger heat sinks of the larger boards will pay off in the long run, and we'll look at VRM temperature shortly to see if that's the case. In terms of memory performance, it's still well within the mix. It may be second from the bottom, but it's well within the expected limits and close to all other models tested. Even the latency is pretty fast at just 63.5 nanoseconds, again, putting it right up there with the big boys. But remember, this board does only have two slots. Moving over to gaming performance, and though the board is small, it proves it can pack a punch, even in one of the most intensive games on the market. Then, in Horizon Zero Dawn, we get strong results again, with a small drop off on the 1% lows, but close enough to be happy overall. In Spider-Man, again, slightly lower on the 1% lows, but overall at 158 FPS, it's not far off the other boards that we tested here today. Finally, Flight Sim scores a nice 99.4 FPS, putting it right into the middle of the big ATX boards and offering up competitive performance overall. So as I mentioned, benchmarks are, for the most part, pretty useless, especially when all boards on the same platform, using the same CPU, GPU and memory, perform within a range of each other. One of the only ways to test that actually shows something different is boot time, as this really is board specific, especially with the way they work with DDR5 through the memory training that they have to do on AMD's platform. With that, the board comes in at 41.51 seconds, which again, puts it right in the middle. So really nothing to complain about overall. The other key area that is worth focusing on comes down to VRM temperatures, which can differ wildly depending on the amount, the capacity of the current that can pass through them, and of course how the various heat sinks actually handle the power, which in turn creates heat. Now you have to remember, this is a mini ITX motherboard, and it literally has the smallest VRM heatsink of any of the motherboards tested. So I guess it's a little surprise that it runs noticeably warmer than all of the others. Though saying that, coming in at just 65 degrees, it's definitely doing a good job. And if that means it can keep up the performance kind of on par with the bigger boards, then I can live with that. The other element that pairs with VRM temperatures is power. And it's here that we find a pretty respectable load of 281 watts, with the idle coming in the lowest we've seen when compared to other boards. Though that is pretty much expected because it's so tiny. What that means for running costs is that it fares well. While I do hate to call this motherboard average because that's underselling what it's capable of, it does like to sit right in the middle of these charts. So with a mini ITX board, you are always going to have a trade-off in terms of features which have to be cut to make space, like memory slots and extra M.2 connectors. But in my opinion, ASUS have done a great job at packing a lot back in through the way of riser cards, desktop units, and stacked connectors. In terms of pricing, let's just get it over with. It's not cheap. It's going to cost you $430 or £460 in the UK, which is a lot. But while it is expensive, it's got just about everything. And actually a little more than many ATX motherboards have, crammed into a tiny form factor. And that puts the price up. But pricing aside, I've got to be honest, 
I absolutely love this motherboard. And I'm going to get right to it and say that it is by far my favorite X670E motherboard so far. Not only does it have performance to take on the big ATX boards that we put it up against, but it does so while being a very trendy mini ITX form factor. And that's gonna be fantastic for those who want seriously fast kind of gaming performance or even as a work PC in a smaller form factor. Of course, as I mentioned, there are some limitations of this motherboard that may not show up in our overall testing. And it's quite a simple one. It's smaller, which means it does have fewer M.2 mounts, fewer SATA headers, and fewer internal USB headers than you know, in comparison to the big boards. But honestly, it's still got more of everything that you typically see in most mini ITX boards. And how many of each of those do you really need for a modest gaming PC build? Furthermore, the VRM and chipset heatsink is obviously smaller and it has to make do with a 10 plus two VRM setup. But our testing did show that it clearly is enough as the CPU performance was right up there with the rest of them. And we'll be able to push those boost clocks when you need them for gaming. But I think there may be some limitations when it comes to overclocking where it's going to hit those thermal kind of headroom limits and that may cause some issues. But as you know, from most of my videos, I do actually believe overclocking for the most part is dead anyway. I mean, if you can live with that, and I know I can, then the performance is on par with full size ATX boards. But one strange thing that I found a little bit weird is having no audio connectors on the rear of the board. But since it comes with that fantastic Strix Hive external amplifier, which also has USB 2.0 port for BIOS flashback, USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C, mic in, headphone jack, a QLED display, volume knob, flex key, it's got everything and all of it from the luxury of sitting on your desk. It is something that I actually really, really like. Plus, having no onboard sound in the way of the heat sinks allows for more cooling on the motherboard. Also, the Hive is actually magnetic, so you get some extra functionality there too. So, I guess it comes down to the big one. Should you buy one? Well, to put it bluntly, this is a little motherboard with seriously big ambitions. It may be expensive, but it's clearly worth every single penny of the asking price. Its performance is on par with the bigger ATX boards on the market, and it delivered reliably and consistently in every single test. And it has extremely impressive connectivity and usability too. Could this be the ultimate mini ITX motherboard for Ryzen fans? Absolutely. And that about wraps up this video. If you enjoyed it, then a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to a ton of exclusive extras, including behind the scenes content, monthly live streams, bi-weekly game nights, and the super special era over on our Discord. The link for all that great stuff is down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.